Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of various stories from across the internet. In this series, we'll be focusing on the web novel, There is no Epic Lucia, only puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we'll be looking at chapters 43 to 44.5. I hope that you enjoy. There is no epic Lucia, only puns, chapter 43, Relish the Thought. Delta watched from a small distance as Rayo played tug-of-war with Bob. The sounds that they were making were akin to a demon and a demanded gym instructor. Delta named the worm Bob to help see the creature as something a little cuter. It kind of worked, in a way. Rayo tugged on the rock as Bob tried to put it back in. They had been at this for a while and Delta was not going to tell them that if that rock had been an actual person, they'd have long drowned or been torn in two by the two forces. It was good to attempt on the monster's efforts, however, trying to save someone was at least something that Delta's books. Rail held the rock in triumph and Bob wiggled in cheer. The worm seemed to just be perpetually happy at everything. Rail flexed and basked in the response of the worm's un- excited noises. Delta eyed the gym tools that seemed to be stacking up against the rock formation as Rail seemed to claim the head of the river as his workout area. Delta had heard of gym rats, never a gym frogs, but she guessed as long as Rail was happy, she should keep gifting him more items fit for the frog king of the gym. She turned to the nearly shrieked as Davinia stood here. Mother, I sent you, and now I hear you. The frog smiled politely and Delta's general direction. Davina, you scared me. Delta scrumbled and Davina just smiled. Her slightly rounded facial features and expressive eyes showed a slight hint of mischief before it vanished back behind the serene gaze. Did I? My apologies. I came to watch Rail and the new one. I spent much time conversing with the Queen Bee. She is rather demanding, but interesting. The Vena spoke with a casual tone, and the small red bee crawled out over her arm before it flew off to investigate a flower nearby. You talk to her, as in, with words, Delta questioned, with delight and Davina shook her head. Her buzzing was mostly noise. We worked out a signal of one buzz for yes and two for no. She did what Tanner once and then laid an egg. I do not know what that means in bee language, but I took it as a polite goodbye. Davina informed her, and Rail paused at the sound of her voice and finally reached him. He turned to stare at Davina and then slowly climbed into the pool to peer at her from the surface before he slowly sank out of sight. Delta blinked, and Davina snorted. He thinks that I am sort of oddity from otherworldly being. He has not spoken to me yet, and my attempts have been met with silence and sudden bursts of running away. It amuses me, so I sought him out. Divina had informed Delta in a hushed tone. She turned and hummed, stroking the flowers and bushes that were formed. She flicked a black mushroom, and it seemed to shrink away from her. Delta raised one eyebrow at the scene and then looked back at the wide eyes of Rail. Peering out over the edge of the pool, he was hard to see as Bob was mimicking him, taking up most of the side of the abyssal pool to stare at Dalvina. He gave a small shriek and Rail nodded. That's her, the other one. He told Bob in confidence. The worm shivered and sank out of view. Delta took the chance to move closer and smile and spoke to Rail. So, why don't you want to talk to her? She wondered and Rail jumped and splashed about in a brief panic. He squinted at her and then turned away. She is distracting. I cannot flex or lift or speak when I am around her. It is some curse or spell that she casts. Mother, I cannot save people with her appearing and making me weak. He hissed, and Delta put a hand over her mouth and tried not to make a noise for a while. I see. That is a dilemma. Well, it is a wise and powerful Delta, she began, and in the far distance, a distant ringing sounded out like a mocking laughter. No, shut up. She yelled at the forming jingle, and turning back to her face fading pink, she continued, The key to defeating her power is constantly to be under it. You build up resistance. Delta said as if it was a big secret. Rail nodded and his eyes lit up with some inner light. I see. I know her weakness and soon I'll be the strongest in the jungle. Rail hissed and sank below the water to plot. 
Delta's lips twitched, and she stood up to leave, and Rail quickly reappeared. Mother, Bob is a bit lonely. He began, and some bubbles rose up with a shriek, and Rail glared down at the depths. If we do not tell her, we cannot improve, he shouted, and turned back to the open air. I cannot always spend time with him, so Bob would like some company. He explained and Bob's shadowy form vanished beneath the sand to hide as if Delta would laugh at him. Delta was too busy trying to stop her heart from breaking at the scene. Bob, the poor thing. She slipped into the water and sank to the dark bottom. Bob, Bob, she called when a pair of pincers barely appeared to acknowledge her. Don't worry, I'm sorry. I should have guessed it was a little harsh for me to leave you in this pool alone. I'm just trying to make the dungeon better in a hurry. So I've been kind of a bad caretaker. <sighs> Here, Delta spent some mana and two crabs appeared. They swam about the pit and settled on the sand. Hey guys, hang out with Bob and try to have a good time, Delta beamed, hoping that she just wasn't setting herself up to deal with two more lonely creatures. With two crabs raised with their claws and did a little dance. Bob appeared and quickly loomed over the two red crabs. They danced and clacked at the claws, not afraid, and Bob slowly began to wiggle and try any dance. He flowed up and the crabs hitched on a ride on his body, and Delta rose with them and saw the crabs now making noises and clicking their little hearts out. Bob was now in full wriggle mode and began to uh, bob his gaping maw and move forward. Delta guessed that he wouldn't become a crabby anytime soon and with the two little guys around. Delta felt the first four seal itself and new appeared. You have guessed. Remember your promise, say hello, see some other amazement at your work, come back and get on with the second floor. I shall let you know if something needs your attention. It is Rudy, Dio and Vass from what I saw before I was locked out. Delta waved him off. Yeah, I know we're eager, but I'd like to have some time with my friends, Mom. She sighed and Noob budged her along. Less sass, more moving. I swear if I wasn't here, you'd be upside down and trapped in some rock. I shall monitor things until you return. Tell the excited child to do the challenge and maybe ask them for a tribute. And we are just on the verge of making this floor into something, and we only need a few more things to make it happen. New sounded so excited and energetic. Delta slowed and a small smile played around her lips. New went from a light green back to a default blue. Well, it still needs work. It's shoddy and your lack of dungeon control skills doubles my work. So rude. I shall eagerly await your return with the dazzling news that Rudy devoured our pond or some such thing. New vanished quickly and Delta didn't even say anything. You're such a drama queen, Delta called and vanished up the stairs to greet the people. Not knowing that the crabs and Bob had heard the entire thing. One of the crabs made a rough box with his claws and began to nag the other. The second crab pounced about and danced, pretending to climb stairs as if it jumped into a pool. Bob looked at them and wiggled in delight. Delta never knew what devils she had unleashed until later. Poppy Roth watched the outside world slowly move. She closed the book in her hand and put it back into place. It was just a book. The only thing that she had to do was to be entertained. It was easy and relaxing. Her mother walked into her room and Poppy already felt that her life was in a little too stressful for the moment before. Poppy, your aunt sent you a greeting from the mail. However, due to the ridiculous outgoing mail ban, I cannot reply. I've left you a space to fill in your own greeting and small talk when it does. Her mom appeared and added on the place that the letter down for Poppy to see in the three neat paragraphs done by her mother. A rough mess of her father's and a space left for her. Poppy took the offered ink pen. I am fine, Poppy. It was rather long-winded, but Poppy just finished a good look and her mood was still somewhat high. Her aunt was going to be overwhelmed by the sheer content of Poppy's segment. Her mother sighed and it was a long argument that no one won. Poppy darling, you can't avoid people forever. While Dio is a bad influence, he is at least an influence. Why did you not go with him to that dungeon place? Ruli is horrifically good at killing things. You would be safe. The older woman inquired, and Poppy squirmed away and sat on her bed. Don't want to. Outside is pain. She answered honestly, and her mother put her own perfectly lipstick mouth. Her soft red hair was in the exact style of popular, and her dress was pleasing but not overly eye-catching. 
Poppy's mother was a butterfly, and Poppy wanted to be a caterpillar forever. Poppy felt the itch of a monster rise up. Silk spinner, the little nudge ran her throat manner, twist an organ and produce silk and not sound. Poppy sighed and squashed it. Her mother would not be pleased if her perfect ensemble became covered in monster string. She could sleep. The resting raging sloth had such power to rest for 18 hours for a power nap. It rose as she thought of it, manner to the eye and a slight amount of brain, and she would simply sleep. She resisted that too. Poppy had the books to read, characters to love, characters to dissect, bad plots to fix on her own notepad. It was a very human thing and nothing popped up in her body when she thought of it. Being a blue mage was the greatest pain of all. Poppy still remembered the day that she had found out. Her dad was an amazing cook and Poppy lived for her father's dishes and gruff rude humor. Poppy loved the meat, tangy vegetables and sweet desserts. The only thing was... Her dad used monster ingredients to reach new tastes and sensations in his dishes. Poppy had eaten those dishes since she had teeth, and the sheer amount of different monsters that she had consumed before she was ten was immense and some of her happiest memories. Then she hit twelve and she began to drool acid like an ant monster, explode with light like a demonic fairy, and more and more abilities. Too many to count. Every emotion... Feeling memory, inclination, causing some power or other to appear. It was terrifying time until she had been identified and taught control. Blue mages gain power from eating or taking an attack from a monster. The downside is that they could never unlearn their powers, so blue mages carefully try to limit their number of spells to prevent. Poppy the base cause of her power, experience, and reaction never faded. Everything outside of her room came with its own building-sized pile of monster powers, gnashing instincts, and she needed to get loose and roar and lash out with power. So Poppy had no real desire to leave her room, not even with Dio. The school was hard enough, but a dungeon. Twice. Poppy felt cramps and the thought. Poppy, it'll get better. You can't stop living your life because of... Her mother trailed off and Poppy looked out the window at a bird nesting in the high branches. It made her back tingle with the power and Poppy closed the curtains and set the room in shadow. The happiest here. Tell Auntie I said hi. Poppy picked up another book and lost herself in another person's untainted feelings. The characters in her books laughed and drank ale. It was just that, an emotion and Poppy pulled her hood over her head so that her mother couldn't see her red eyes. You were so awesome, Dio praised as Vas and the Golem easily avoided the webs and completed the challenge. Dio was absolutely covered in somewhat rare web after his attempt had him tripping over the wire Delta had set up for the engrading spiders. Rudy just kept a smaller teen at an arm's length. Nice vest, she commented as Vas held the web shirt out like a monster as well. You should wear it, it'll be like me. Dio grinned, making Vass's face soften. It folded the shirt out and slid it on without a word. Dio looked pleased and Ruli was about to comment on the two when her words died off. Dalta watched with glee as Ruli's dark eyes went wide at the expanded pond before her. Dalta, you crafty little minx. Ruli almost danced as she rushed into the expanded room. Dio followed and looked around, waving his hands. It's so big now! Hello! He yelled and Vas trembled as the sound traveled through him. Delta felt a whine in her ear and she had tinnitus. Rudy was looking around the pond and pointed with a fanged grin. A golden fish! Delta, just pop a ring out already. I'm all yours. She cheered and pulled out her ugly duck cap, snapping it on her head. Waddles eyed it with interest and Delta watched the duck with a wary eye. Ruli pulled out her rod from the protective sleeve, and Vass sat down quite far from the water, watching the scene in his web shirt with Dio next to him in his web outfit. As Ruli began to wind things up, they all froze as a drumming sounded out. It was energetic, vast, slightly repetitive, but catchy. It made the mood instantly sore. Ruli was frozen, her hidden eyes in some hair. She looked up at the ceiling where the drumming echoed through every wall. Yes! 
She hissed and her muscles bunched and her hair whipped up in the silent storm as the drum set some fire inside of Rudy to the highest level. Dungeons do not have music unless there is a cursed music or lures people into traps. Vaz exclaimed and Dio was literally vibrating on the spot. His eyes were wide as he seemed to be absorbed in the very thudding of the drums. He put his entire body flat on the ground. There is drums! You have to believe me, I feel them! He shouted, and Ruli was already winding up the rod. Hogren, devilish. It's the sound of my new favorite place on the plain welcome me home. She looked back so Dio could see her lips. Vass stood and watched the hook fly straight into the enlarged pond. Delta saw the goblins arrive and begin to cheer as Ruli baited a new fish. Delta wondered if she would find the secret tunnel. She sort of hoped not, and the second floor wasn't done, and she kind of wanted to wow her friends with some complete scene of misty jungle. Mysteries awaiting them, and the call of adventure, the song of bees. They would get to meet Bob. Her manner was now rising at a slow but steady rate. She closed her eyes and bid her friends goodbye for the moment. Their cheering and bodies filled with the drums of her greater mushy made her feel like she was leaving a party that promised memories that she would cherish. But Delta was only as good as her promises, so she flew down to the second floor, hoping against all hope that maybe she did enough fast enough and that she could come back and have fun. Then she could let them all come down here and they could stay even longer, and Delta could enjoy having human interaction for a bit longer. It was this hope that had her fly directly to the far end of the jungle room and start building to her new core room. Eager? New, no, let's build this floor. Let's kick ass and make this place something to be remembered. Delta shouted and New no, moved back in alarm. Mad. Well, regardless, you are correct. This will be a floor to be hailed as a story to be spread to one lure more people in. We shall stall them, suckle their manner, and let them have fun and make them regret leaving. We shall taint them with kindness. New screen took dark blue, with glee as the hallways and rooms before them hollowed out perfectly. Delta flexed her growing manner to move the core to this room. As she did so, the decorations appeared. The Fran statues, the four stone mushrooms, and... With those two fish fountains, the fish curved out of the stone basins and gargled the water as the tiny hole near the base and Delta's twin earth pillar held her core. She had to see these two statues on either side of her call now, and it Delta remembered that she had gained a decoration from the pond evolutions. Fancy, I feel fancy. Delta decided and beamed, as her call now had a river and some bees between it, and any troublemakers. Delta quickly removed the far right of the room and flexed her hands. One corridor coming up. Delta called with her voice filled with energy. Old Lady Josie closed the photo album. The tech was handy and not very useful inside dungeons due to mana pollution, but the sheer number of pictures she had amassed over the years. Someone cleared their throat and she didn't even turn to look at her guest. Holdy, I could smell you a mile away. You're using strong stuff. We know that doesn't end well. She called and a cheerful old man came over and sat down across from her, the simple table between them. Mila, how long has it been since we talked? He greeted and Mila smirked. Three hours ago, what do you want? She tapped the album with her fingers and Holdy looked at her without fear. Twenty years ago, the small pleasant man before her had been a wild hare and with a glint in his eyes. He'd explored things most people would balk at even considering, including Mila herself. Then made her smoke again. She, Holdy, Pick and Durance had been a solid team. Oh, there were the years and when Mila could conquer any beast or any heart. Mila, the dungeon is going to be digging deeper soon. Should we not be more cautiously prepared? He asked and the pleasant memories of the old days turned to ash as blood in Mila's mind. No, everything is dead. I made sure of that. Let the dungeon dig and remove the last vestiges of that fracking hole from existence. Delta is at least innocent. She began and how this smile was polite but harsh. Malleable to your whims, I think you mean. He challenged and Mila let it go. Her eyes were pulsed once. Old tired watchers that were coming to life due to the dungeon manner rising. 
Point being that it is rather that I have a naive, innocent, bumbling girl in this land than face those accursed freckers. They... I have lost enough to them. We have lost enough. We promised, on his grave, that we would die here, making sure that nothing got in or out. Now was our chance to make sure that we missed nothing, and then nothing is left. She banged the table and broke it. Haldi's face turned blank. We gave up everything, you need not remind me. I had a future, but I gave it all up like you did. We promised Durance that we would keep the peace. Now we have children here, neighbors, shops, bakers, and all sorts. We've become old and now things are happening, and the next generation has to deal with it. Not us, if we don't last. It's sad and annoying, he scoffed. Mina picked up the photo album and opened up to a picture of a little girl with large fangs and a giggle on her face. A wild black hair and dark skin. Even in this picture, she held up a wriggling rat that she had trapped. Mila had even given that up for the promised. We can only wait, she said quietly, the holy side. The room felt empty. Even with Pick showed up with the share of his concerns, the fourth and final seat would never be filled again. Her only saving grace was that she was sure, confident, that she had gotten them all. Delta stared at the huge room her corridor collapsed into. It was enough of a cave, it had rocks, moss bugs, and all the things that made a cave nice. What did not belong was the garish purple and orange circus tent, tarnished and faded with age, but rather well preserved. The flap of the tent moving as if beckoning her closer, and there was an oppressive silence about the place. Room cannot be conquered until all inhabitants are defeated, contracted, or removed. Something was in here, and Delta felt the room's chill soak into her body. She looked around and saw that the space wasn't exactly natural. The room had edges and clear design where the stone had been cut away to make space. Something was not quite right. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 44. Mime the Gap. Delta couldn't really step foot in the room. Her body just stopped at a certain point. She pushed and shoved, but the firm barrier prevented her entry into the odd space. I do not like this. What is a structure like that doing so far below ground? Giving me the heebie-jeebies. Ugh. We need to send someone inside. Delta said with hesitation, and Davina cleared her throat. Delta let out a screech and Nu flew so high that he vanished near the ceiling. Mother knew. Davina nodded seriously, and Delta, clutching her heart, scowled, but quickly felt having more company near the cave. Davina scouts this room. It could be a danger, and there is something inside, but I do not know what. Delta was about to nod, and then something crossed her mind. She can't. She's... She doesn't have the respawn point, Delta protested, and Nu didn't say anything. If she dies, I can't bring her back. Delta went, and but Davina moved ahead without a sound. Davina, stop, Delta cried, and the tall frog did so. You heard me. You won't come back to life if you die there. Just... Just let me figure something out. Maybe Hob and Gob can come down, or I can block up again, and we can plan something. Rudy is upstairs, Delta said quickly, and Davina tilted her head. Her large black eyes seemed to see more than Delta could. Mother, I am your child. You're Davina, and I am not simpering a bee or a dancing crab. I am a warrior of the jungle, Davina said and resumed walking. Davina, stop, stop, Davina, I am ordering you to stop. Delta shouted, and there was a moment where Davina froze before she looked back. I'm too like you, mother. I must help, and it's my nature, in my soul. Your gift onto me, and I will not shy away from it. Davina smiled. Her spear, which Davina had never carried off to summoning, was now held tightly. Please, please, I don't want to lose anyone. Delta tried and pleaded with Nu and appeared before her. Do not take stupid risks. I... Expect you back shortly, Davina of the Dungle. Davina smiled and touched her chest where her heart would roughly be on a human. Mother's kindness and your shrewdness, what a lovely creature I am. She laughed and darted forward like a shadow. Delta felt her heart lurch as Davina ignored her orders and knew only hummed softly. You forged them with love and will. It is any surprise that they would just use it against you, to save you. 
Delta only stared as Davina moved to crouch low near the tent flap, still moving in a window that was open in the inside causing a draught. Then the frog slept inside and Delta prayed. She prayed for the woman's safety. The unknown was already making her nerves flush with panic. What was Davina seeing? What was ahead of her? Delta needed to know. She needed it. Delta was inside the tent. The backspace loomed ahead. Delta tried to move her head, but it didn't budge. A hand reached out, webbed and holding a spear. Davina. Delta watched the dark tent through amphibious eyes. The circuit tent was large enough to host a fair crowd, and the stands encircled the ring. It reminded her of Fran's room. The jungle beats within me. My spear be fast. My task be done. Divina almost said silently, barely whispering it to herself, then some odd chant. The empty stands, the high wires, the net only caught shadows now. The tent was dead, as it was promised, but there was one thing that remained out of place. In the middle of the ring, where the master would direct lions, acrobats, clowns, and strong men, was a single chair facing the entrance. It was a simple wooden chair that offered no comfort. There was someone sitting in it. Davina's eyes saw white gloves and grasped in its lap, and a striped black and white shirt that looked like a time had let lines run slightly. The skin, the arms and neck, faces were all pale white, unnatural, too smooth and almost paint-like. The thing wore a black and white jester cap and two pointy ends. It seemed to have no mouth, nose or facial features in the general, but there its eyes should be. There were two black painted diamonds, each with the point of the diamonds, trailing off into the thin lines. Davina was about to move when it twitched. It lifted its head and seemed to inhale. Dust and other unknown substances breaked off its body as if the creature had not moved in a very long time. Delta felt cold, waited for the shriek or scream, but it simply stood and sniffed again. It looked thin, and its clothes simply hung off its frame. Delta felt the new sense of fear at pitying the sort of awareness. How long had this thing been trapped here? Years. Delta couldn't imagine being trapped under such rock and dirt. She would go mad. A sense of sorrow rose for the black and white creature as hesitantly shuffled forward towards Davina, who, despite being in a perfect shadow, was spotted. Maybe this thing just needed a way out, or a friend. Delta felt a spark of hope rise up in her, and the mime's face split open and ear to ear, and a row of white teeth struck out from its black mouth. Delta screeched, and Davina yelled, throwing her spear at the thing as it moved forward. The mimed put its hand out flat against the air, and the spear simply crashed against the invisible barrier. Get out! Get out! Get out! Delta screamed, and Davina jolted into the run out of the tent. The spear flew over the head and propelled with a great force. Davina rushed down the tunnel and back into the jungle. New vanished and Delta was left alone and startled Davina. New, where are you going? Delta called out to New but didn't appear. There was a movement in Davina's foot suddenly lifted by some invisible rope. The demonic mime was at the tunnel's entrance, yanking on the other end of the unseen rope. No, stay away from her. Delta stood between the mime and Davina, who was reaching up to scratch some solid thing around her ankle. Delta's legs were shaking and she whimpered as the thing came closer, mouth leaking black saliva as it drooled and struggling Divina. Stop! G go away! Leave her alone! Delta screamed and the mime froze. It sniffed again and something else seemed to catch its attention. It turned and looked directly at the exposed dungeon core in the distance, pulsing in distress. It immediately ignored Divina and began to shamble towards the gore. Davina dropped and Delta was about to tell her to run, but with some mad screeching, Davina launched herself and with a powerful jump towards the mime. You will not touch mother, Davina shouted, with a powerful kick sent the mime crashing down. It still made no noise, absolutely none. It was just as unnerving as the black jewels and the sharp teeth. Davina raised her leg to stomp hard, but the mime made a motion of pulling Something on the ground, and Davina was sent tumbling to the ground. It got up, and Davina was about to swipe when the mime placed both of its hands over, and Davina was suddenly squashed inside a box. 
The mime eyed the box and put something else on top of the box, its knee shaking from the object. Davina jerked and Delta tried to kick the mime's power, but nothing worked. Davina was trapped and Delta saw the mime begin to walk towards the core room again. Please, stop, stop, just go away, you freaky ripple clown freak. Delta shouted and the core crackled and warning energy. He only made the mime more eager. Delta didn't want to leave Davina and she couldn't do anything to stop the mime. There was a wave of helplessness and Delta felt frustrated tears rising up. The mime moved closer and then stopped as a large stone bar from the stone disc snapped at the head back. Only the strong and worthy may approach mother. You reek of foul weakness, Rail said in a large greenish arms bulging with force as he yanked the weight out of the mime's face. The thing's visage looked crumpled and caved and then there was the sickening plopping noise and the head snapped back into shape. Such an odd creature. Sorry for the departure. I went to find the muscle head. New sounded dry and bored, and Delta made it feel better, her emotions now blurring with fear and relief. I thought you left me. She whispered and knew Ding softly, a menu leaving its usual. Bravish the thought. I don't drop projects, no matter how irritating or mushroom inclined they become. New, Delta said, wiping furiously at her face. The mind made a motion of picking something up, and swinging, and Rail held his weights defensively and slid back with a little grunt. Weak foe, do you not even lift weights of Mother Delta? He roared and lifted the improvised weapon, and the mime was sent flying up and over into a tree. The tree made of crunching noise, and the mime was still silent. It stood and rolled its neck in an unnaturally jerky way. The mime then looked less droody and a bit more annoyed. Is that all you possess, colorless fly? Rail boasted, and the mime made a motion as if to strike something against its heel and put its other hand flat in the air, as if resting it on something big. It reminded Delta of the old movies when someone was about to fire a... Rail, move! Delta tried, but the mime put an invisible match of the equally unseen cannon. Rail was sent flying back, his powerful stomach being imprinted in a wound round object. He was sent hurtling into the river, skipping once on the surface and landing on the other side. He rolled and then slowed to a halt. Rail! Delta yelled and a large frog moved, rolling over to vomit. Well, if we could lure it over to Bob, that might help. You suggested, but the mime turned back to the core. Grinning, Delta was about to start spending DP and mana to slow the mime down, but New suddenly vanished as Dio appeared far across the level, staring at or at the large jungle room, as Vass was escorted down and worried by Mr. Mushy. Delta felt stunned. Her powers became locked and her two guests were too far to properly see what was going on. The mime was too close to her core. It was too late. There was nothing stopping the white teeth from reaching the core. From reaching Delta. It was over and Delta felt numb. Over. It had barely begun. No. I'm sorry, she whispered as the mime reached the tunnel. There was a silence and something thumped to the ground heavily beside her. Delta opened her eyes to see that someone walked back from the near tunnel, a series of broken bushes and branches blowing in the path carved by the newcomer starting at the riverbank. Woo-wee! That's one ugly mother frecker I have ever seen, Rudy said, her face devoid of a usual jovial expression. She looked at the dripping wet and her duck hat looked burned, and the brown feathers turned jet black. Quack! Waddles grumbled on top of Rudy's head. Delta gaped as Rudy looked like she had swum through the secret passage. The mime looked up at the ceiling, its mouth still open. It slowly raised itself to the sitting position, as if still confused. Duck, I guess you were right. Rudy tilted her head and then some water leaked out of the woman's hair. Waddle shuffled, but still didn't jump down from Rudy's head. Rudy, Delta yelled, and such a powerful happiness. Rudy nodded once. Your duck went a little nuts and showed me a secret way down. Nice touch. The pool felt weird. Something touched my ass, and I didn't look back to check. She sounded so casual. She smoked. Your call is so close that I can almost hear you. But you know, creepy mime, not funny. Rudy said, now standing mime. It shrugged and made the cannon motion again. Waddles cracked, sounding so deep that it rumbled. Delta shivered, and the mime glowed black. And it struck its heel and... 
paused. It struck its heel again. It looked at its finger, where the unseen match apparently refused to light. It scratched its head in puzzlement and looked up to see Rudy putting an exhausted bird down. Waddle's chest was heaving from the effort. What's wrong? Did you know that dog drakes affect all luck? Things that can't go wrong will, Rudy called, and her walk steadily increased in pace. The mine made a climbing motion and scaled a ladder up. Rudy leapt and easily caught the thing as it tried to go over Rudy. They fell and fought in the upper hand, and the goodish mime bit into Rudy's shoulder, making the woman snarl as she punched it hard enough that its head snapped back again. Frecker, she said and flexed her wounded shoulder a bit and expelled the dark fluids as it began to knit back together. She watched as the mime also started to fix itself. Well, isn't this pointless fight already? Rudy said sarcastically, and the mime made a one-moment gesture, and its neck squished and its spine back under its skin. Ignoring physical damage, teeth like a rat mutant, freaking creepy, a ghoul. Rudy spat and eyed the pulsing core behind her and her own hands. Another floor, and I'd be good for this, but... Rudy muttered and Delta watched with horror at the scene of the undying mime. She rushed over and made sure Waddles was going to be okay. Delta, I need your permission, Rudy began, watching as the mime seemed to pull something out of its pocket and shook it, before throwing away it appeared to be broken. The black aura around it became a little thinner. What, what for? Delta asked and Rudy closed her eyes, as if to listen. I need your mana. Pure dungeon mana. I need to drain some to give me the edge here. She explained as the mime flicked a match and it seemed delighted at the apparent flame. Yes, all of my yes. Just do what you need to do. Delta agreed and Rudy looked pain. Delta, you're too nice. You know that. She said and jumped back and flew down Delta's tunnel. The mime looked confused and then danced on the spot as it saw what Rudy was doing. Delta peered down and saw Rudy put her mouth on Delta's core and inhaled. Orange manner beginning to flake off. It looked like Rudy was drinking orange stars and... Oh... Oh, oh, it hurt, it hurt, hurt. Dalta felt awareness snap into numbers. The world around her became her, them, and numbers. Ones and precious zeros flowed into the numbleness of Rudy. There were no numbers in Rudy. Just being and what was wrong had beautiful. She was a mix of charming blue, scarred, and tough and unbridled red rage that swam together in some dance that worked together to exist. Delta was inside Rudy's ocean, and the numbleness existence that burned before her numbers became Rudy's ocean water. She forced her eyes on the mime and saw old things, shapes that were not quite right, and the mime had touches and burns on itself, numbers that had left scars. A deep, dry wasteland where tiny droplets of orange numbers breathed grey grass back into life and formed the grass became a whisper. I am not me, please, please hear me. It was quickly swallowed by the dry wasteland of numbers. The mana was not enough to sustain the growth. Not enough mana. So hungry. It was so hungry and Delta wept for it. Then the pain stopped. Mana. One out of eighty. It was a relief to Delta once more. The mime shuddered silently and walked backwards away from the tunnel where Delta's core was. Smoke bellowed out and the blanketed the darkness where the dimming star of her core barely blinked. The shadow moved and a monster held the mime by the throat. Delta felt utter fear rise up as Rudy's form appeared. She easily broached eight feet tall now. Her clothes were torn, unable to keep up with the growth entirely. The black skin drank any light that touched it, and curling horns and white bones jutted out like a crown. Her face was beautiful and mind-numbingly terrifying, and the tail was a wicked spine's flowed and moved like a bored cat. Fire and shadows danced around Ruli now, eager, like children, and Delta felt something alien about her where it had never been before. Mana from the core, drain it dry, and it's like five levels worth of mana hitting you at once. Was that what you smelled? Ruli asked in inquiring tone, calm like the mime who's just an oddity. It's painful. If you cannot spare the mana, like taking in too much blood, it begins to cause damage. Delta, sweet, lovely Delta, she had none, and yet I took it because you made me. 
Rudy chided playfully, and there was a cracking noise as she began to crush the mime's neck. Davina had gone very still, as if Rudy inspired some primordial fear in the frog. Waddles was tiredly moving to protect Delta's core from any more harm, but the bird was still exhausted. Dio and Vass were coming closer, and Mr. Mushy trying to pull them back in fear. I hurt Delta. Do you hear me? I hurt my friend to hurt you in return. Does that make sense? Does that penetrate your silent fracking head? Rudy snarled, black fire leaking out each breath, and her hand began to burn the mime from its touch alone. The creature let out a quiet screech. Delta tried to move. She flopped and tried to speak, her tongue like a dead flesh flopping with no life. This, this was not what she wanted. Delta had seen something. She had seen consciousness and the deep bits of the mind's being. Rudy's tail whipped and cracked and the air that she had time to hire. She was going to burn the mime and kill him. Delta could see it. No. Feel it. Her manner was in Rudy and Delta fault that the heat and hatred of the mime, of herself, flow back into Delta. There was a small bond now, limited and fading, just enough for this to alert Delta. She managed to stand. Stop, she said, and no one paid her attention. Not Waddles, not Rudy, not Davina, not knew who was gone. No one listened. Delta tugged on the painful words of numbers, fueled by desperation, fear, anger, and hope. Stop! Her voice sounded from the heavens, shook the ground, vibrated out of every plant, rock, flowing water, and the very air. Rudy dropped the mind as it burned herself. She spun and stared at Delta. You! She began and Delta strode forward to put both hands in Rudy's large form. Stop! Stop! Just stop! No more! This... There are other ways that we can solve this. I refuse to let fear and anger drive me just to kill. Rudy, thank you, thank you for being my friend. Delta hiccuped, and Rudy winced as if Delta had slapped her. Delta, you... you have a body, she tried to say. Oh, wonderful and terrifying features mixed with a lovely human confusion. Delta looked down to see her orange body of an avatar, already fading away. She turned to the mime on the ground and curled up and burned. Violence, it will happen, but I will not tolerate murder. I just have to think, Delta said without hesitation and continued to speak. Why does a mime want to eat a dungeon core? She asked as if setting up a bad joke. There was no answer, so Delta bent down and gave a weak smile. Because everyone gets a little grumpy if they get hungry. She spoke and willed her desire to the mime. The mime lowered its arm, shielding its face and eye to the display box. The dungeon core Delta would like to form a contract. Do you accept? My name is Delta. This visible state of mind won't last long, but I would like it very much if you'd become my friend. I can take care of your hunger. Just please stop eating people. Please be a good mime instead. She begged, her orange avatar flaking off onto mime, soaking into his skin, and the mime tilted his head, and then thing fell off. Delta went numb and all thought became a silent scream, and the mime looked to keel over in death, but suddenly shook with a silent laughter, put its head back on and its neck and it tapped the accept button, still shaking and unheard laughter. It began to glow. What is happening? I fell into the river and missed everything. A soaking went Dio asked. Delta had no answer for him. She really, really didn't have an answer for him. End of chapter there is no epic lucha, only puns. Interlude. Cheesecake. Haldi nodded to the new baker girl as she put out a lovely selection of bread, pastries and delightful desserts in her display case. She smiled back and Haldi felt a little flutter of happiness. Someone who didn't look like they would rather be anywhere else when they saw him. He was sure that would soon change if the poor lass stuck around Durance. He heaved the box in his arms a bit tighter and higher as he headed for his home. Haldi didn't honestly mean to make people so at odds with him. Mila was able to put up with him, as did Pick, but that was because they had grown old with him, seeing his uh, quirks develop into the state that he was in now. Quiss walked around the corner and paused mid-step. Haldi pretended that he hadn't noticed the young lad, letting the peacekeeper retreat without a look of relief on his face. Haldi hid a size and nudged the door open. When had it all gotten this bad? 
He had always been a blabbermouth, but only in the last few years had it progressed to the full-blown destruction of his social life. I can list a dozen cheese recipes lost to the world that can kill a dragon or cure diseases, but I can't seem to keep my mouth shut long enough to make a friend any more. Oh, Durance, what would you say to me now? He looked down at his old friend would kick the door down any moment and laugh life's problems away before getting them both into trouble. Ha! Come on, being an elementalist is boring. Here, I paid half my year's salary for the ancient scroll of magic. It's said to allow you to control the most powerful force. Durance was the fool of the group and the heart. The hole which Durance's death had left made Haldi look at the growing town with a sense of growing pride and a hint of regret. Most powerful force indeed. Haldi sat the box down and had excavated from where he had buried it near the town centre. Various odours leaked out and Haldi inhaled. Some of the contents were ready, others still needed time. Jeez, the world had changed Haldi's life. It started with a scroll with controlling cheese. Durin spent all of his money on buying it from some scam artist at the time. Powerful magics were still a popular to sell to the unwary, and Haldi knew that more than enough oddball classes had been forged due to the clink of some coins. Durance had spent so much money that he had not he had not been able to afford better armor for himself. Haldi shook, and he closed the box. He flicked his hand and the cheese candles around the room caught fire. The smell of a rather plain cheese filled the space, and Haldi moved to the back of the room and pulled out the most cupboards and off the shelves. Durance, the town had become rather lively recently, due to the new dungeon nearby. Then the manor rose to the standard manor level of one. It had surprised Haldi. He had avoided the council meetings and the town meetings as people stared at him with dread whenever he was about to speak. So he had missed out on a lot of news. Durance had been manor empty for a long time, barely alive with what was offered. Still, manor made him think faster, speak faster, and Haldi wondered if that would actually be talking faster than moss growing on a stone. Magic was a problem like that. Many mages, wizards, sorcerers, and other in-between magical folk chose their magic with care as opening themselves to a particular magic began to change them in return. Cheese, for example, in Haldi's mind, seemed to cause rather tough and ripe ideas to form, but the manor in the area went sparse or even empty. And then the mage's mind would become slow, filled with holes that had a bad habit of speaking like moldy milk. Unwanted, and glumpy. Manor was important for a mage, even an ambient manor. So then the dungeon did it again, and the manor became rank two. Haldi had woken up and had washed, put on fresh clothes, and been outside before midday had even passed. It was wonderful. Haldi could also now feel the stirrings of magic, filling those previously empty Swiss holes in his mind. Oh, the things that he had forgotten, the pain he'd let slip away. Ha! Come on! I don't think you're a failure. You're too cool to be anything less than my friend. The joy that he let slip away, he thumped his hand down on the collection of items and jumped and rattled. I made a promise, he barked, furious with himself, and turned to get to work. Aldi pushed the iron pot over the stove and began to pour things into the vat. Pinch of elf ear brie, an aged stench of wormed ring rind, the herbal essence of dryad milk, and a wedge of lancra blue. Haldi moved his hands over the boiling pot as the ingredients bubbled furiously. His left hand glowed with a dark yellow aura, manner converting through his soul. One could not simply be a geomancer and then become a cassiomancer in a short time. Another potential risk of magic and dedication. Haldi's body, his mind, his being had become attuned. His being had become attuned with the very notion of cheese. He trained, devoured, slept on stolen, mutilated, sacrificed so much cheese that he himself had become a little cheese-like inside. Manor flowed through him, be it of air, fire, or other, and became cheese inflicted, the perfect manner to work with his magic. No other manner would quite get the same results as cheesy manner did. Haldi had done great, terrible things with cheese, and some things that he did out of curiosity, some things he did out of anger, and all things that he did for the sake of the promised endurance. 
he had brought the arrogant lords to their knees, sent dark queens to retirement, stinking of cheese to the end of the time. And he had brought life to this world, and naught but his wool and cheese. And Haldi had been so foolish and wrathful in fulfilling that promise that he had forsaken another. Mina and Pick had stayed as they had needed to, and Haldi had not. He had set out on a journey, and the cheese below in the pot bubbled, and the claw reached out and the primordial cheese. Haldi flicked it, and it collapsed back into the cheese sauce. He had taken a journey that went through every guild, every royal lord, every arrogant royal guard, until he stood before the king himself. Haldi remembered the fear in that room when he had the king sword broke and crowned the skew on his knees. He still remembered the fear. And the question, Why are you doing this? The younger king had asked Haldi. Haldi was only a member feeling so tired and he responded. Only grief and rage keeping him from standing before the powerful yet defeated king. Because he had hoped that you would come and yet you did not. I saw that hope die and I am here to make sure that you will never forget that mistake. The cheese thickened and Haldi opened the window for the steam to escape. His malt pots didn't need overfeeding. He lifted the pot and placed it onto the table and began to spoon a fair amount into the tiny circle. Buttermilk rise, brine fall, let my words be heard. I make thee into my wool, give shape to a bird. He commanded and the cheese bubbled and bubbled together. And the small sparrow was a rather plain. Its beak looked like a little droopy and the cheese hadn't solidified quite right. Hmm, needs more way, but it will do for now. Springy Sparrow delivered this message. No detours, no milk thievery, no gluttonous feastings of bread. Haldi smoothed down the weathered face, and his skin it seemed to lose its papery texture it gained after channeling. He was never going to be this young again, but Haldi was just beginning to remember exactly how much cheesy manner made his skin look less human. It was never quite the same result, and one time he had rather puffy cheese scales for a while. The bird lifted off and wandered near Haldi's mouth as if to hear some secret. Haldi smiled at the obedient magic. To the guild leader author, I hope the birds find you well. I find myself in need of your services. You will come to me. You know where I am. Bring it all. As always, the man who could have let you die. Haldi. Not Haldi's best threats for the author, but it would do. The bird poked up as Haldi focused, printing an image of Arthur. A slight echo of the man's manner, it would be enough to get the bird started. Don't fly it too high, lest you melt the bride, Haldi murmured, and the bird flew out into the window. He looked out and saw the lost baker girl trying to find somewhere. Durance's ghost grinned at him from the long past memory. Don't be shy, Hull, people love you, if you would just talk anything other than cheese for two minutes. Just ask her. The voice faded and Haldi closed his eyes. His hands trembled, and he blinked away the flash of tears. Dear, I hope you're watching, he said, and he strode out the door. Long past was his youthful passions. All he had now was a helpful ear to lend to his new cheese. Ahoy, you look lost, he called out, and he managed to speak without too much time passing. The baker girl spun and smiled. Mr. Haldy. Yes, I was looking for somewhere to keep my earnings. The safe is getting full, and I'm not sure where to go. She laughed nervously, and Haldi held out an arm. My lady, I would be honored to show you to the bank. Mr. Vaughn is clever as a snake. Let me make sure that you get the best service possible. He smiled, and the girl giggled, slipping her own arm through his. Harmless, she saw him as a polite old man. Haldi was sure that she had not yet made the connection between old Mr. Haldi and Haldi the mage of the most foul, outlawed and wanted dead or alive, preferably dead in most of Velirin. Haldi let the innocence last a little longer. He felt himself rise back to full. Mana flowed in from the dungeon, and a lot flowed right back into the ground, where it served its purpose. He, Mila, Pick, and of course Durance kept the land rich with mana for so long. It was nice to have help from that dungeon. Haldi wondered if Mila had warned it of what it might find. He would do it soon if he'd only because he knew what Durance would think of Mila's nature. Pick's logical, illogical reasoning and Haldi's insanity. 
How the old Delta, some of Durance's kindness. Not this bustling town, but the hero of the land. A title Haldi had carved into the most important places so no one would ever ignore or forget them. Durance the Saint, Durance the Great, Durance, Haldi's best friend. Gods, Haldi missed him. The girl offered him a sandwich. It had cheese on it. Haldi chuckled and told a rather good joke on cheese. He cut himself once he saw he devolved into a factoid rumble. The girl looked relieved and began to perk up again chatting to him about how calm and peaceful Durance was. Haldi let a small show as she didn't run away. Knew you could do it, my buddies are always winners. They both walked past the centerpiece of the town in which the town grew out from, a large round rock that had a single name carved into it and the styles of different cuts below it. Durance, idiot and hero, I am so sorry. You did good, rest now. I... We'll never forget you. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.